My, um, I, I told my, uh, um, I was talking with my daughter the other day who was in the U.S. And, and I was telling her that I had to teach a makeup class today. And the makeup was because the first class was on a holiday. And I said, I explained to her that the first, we, had to, we have to have a makeup class because the, make, the first class was on a national holiday. So the makeup class is on a national holiday. And <laughs> so, so the question is, well, how do you explain something? <laughs> and, and, and now my wife, my, my wife says, well, it, it's because some national holidays are more important than others. Now, my, my, the only explanation that I actually, I have no explanation for these things. I have a good friend, though, who told me, he said, he told me years ago, he said, when you get confused about things in, in, in this country, why ask, just tell yourself, why ask why? Uh, that is, just don't even bother. <laughs> And I, I remember when I would first, first came to this country, and, and, and there would be some holiday or some, some thing, and I would say, well, what, you know, what's the holiday for? What, what was the holiday for? Yeah. And they would stop, and they, would, and they couldn't explain. And then the next holiday came, <laughs> and they couldn't explain. Or then I would, before I could read anything, and I would say, well, what's, what does this paper say? And they I realize that, not, that, that, that all of these holidays and the paper and every, none of it really meant anything. So uh, yeah. that was the answer. So, so God, I stopped worrying about what, what any of it meant. Um, and I have no idea what this holiday is for. And I think they created it because there was no holiday in July. And so they created a holiday in July, so there would be a holiday in July. And so that's why there's a holiday in July. It didn't have one. It was a lonely, lonely month. So now we have it. Unfortunately, though, because it's, it was a holiday that really has no reason to exist, they made us come and, 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 and come and be in this class today. And um, so I, I hope to make the lecture as exciting as possible. I'm going to be talking about general equilibrium, which is probably about as the, one of the least exciting topics that one could ever imagine in, in economics. It's important, but it's it, in terms of excitement, I, I can't uh, promise anything there. Uh, but, so I thought that at least to, to keep your interest, but before you fall asleep, that we'll, that we'll talk about that we'll talk about um, some of the uh, the exercise questions, and, and and I want to point out that if you have not received, if if you're missing an exercise question answer sheet up to 22, then I didn't I I, I think I didn't get a a, a a a question from you, so it might be that I just missed it. It's my it, the email. Uh, as I say, with, with, uh, with uh, Gmail, it's hard, at, at times very difficult. Sometimes it's easy to overlook, and you said you, like, you sent me something, and so I have to go dig in the email and, and, and see. It's very easy to miss it, so uh, just I'll, I'll send a, a message out just to make sure. Um, uh, I'll let you know that if there's anything missing, um, uh, because we're coming to the end of the term, uh, I, I want to have everything turned in by uh, Thursday, uh, include, of course, you have one last one. Uh, so please, um, uh, uh, please I, I, if, if anything is late after that, I, I'll, I will, I'll give you uh, credit for uh, the, the effort and, and, the, um, uh, 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 and, and the accuracy, but I'll, I'll give you a zero score for, for, for uh, timeliness. So get all of that to me. Uh, if there's anything missing, get that to me. I'm going to be checking to make sure if I think you've got something missing, I'll contact you and let you know. Uh, most people are, are caught up to date. Most people are in, in very good shape. Uh, most of you are, are, are in good shape. Um, but we'll confirm all of that uh, uh, over, over the next uh, uh, day or two. So I'll be getting this answer sheet and going over those, most of you turned that in today. Some people actually did turn this a little bit early. One person turned it in a week ago. They didn't, I think they didn't realize that the, dead, that the deadline had been extended, uh, but that's okay. 
Um, but I wanted to go over uh, go over these to um, because it might have been either confusing or, and I think this is an important question. I did have someone that, that was contacting me last late last night about that. We were communicating about this, and uh, I could see that some there might have been a little bit of, of confusion. Now it, it says, well, suppose you win. 100 million yen in the lottery. You pick one of, one of the big lotteries and, and you win uh, 100 million yen. I, I, I don't know exactly how the, the payments go, but I'm just saying typically these lotteries, when you win a lottery, you are, you'll get annual payments over a series of years. They, you usually don't get paid a lump sum at the, at the beginning. Uh, it's usually a payment that's spread out over, over a number of years. So what I've, I've said was I want, this is a question, that in, let's say you get a cash flow. You get, you're getting a cash flow. You've been told you'll receive 5 million yen annually for 20 years. The first one coming today, and then, and then annual payments. So you, you've got, what you have is you're going to get a, a payment now, time zero, year zero, of 5 million yen. And then at the end of year one, you have five million yen and annual payments thereafter to year 19. So that's the cash. So you can see that you're getting cash in the future. Well, now remember, if I'm going to give you five million, assume that this is a mil five million yen bills at five thousand. But if I'm going to give, would you rather have this now or a year from now? Would, would you, if, if I said you get it a year now, would you value it more than a year from now? Well, I think your answer is you take it now. You'd rather have it now. You can do something with it. Among other things, you can invest it. You, you can invest it yourself. So why not get it now and invest rather than waiting for a year? <laughs> you know, waiting for a year, you can't, you know, no, you could borrow. You could borrow, you could do stuff, but uh, but basically, you'd rather have it now. And the point is, if you're, that means if you'd rather have it now, then sometime in the future, it's going to be worth less. So the question is, how do we think about this? How, what's the right way uh, to think about this? Well, is there a, is there a discount rate? Is it is there a discount rate on on this cash flow? No, there is no discount rate on this cash flow. So we have to, where do we get a discount rate? How do we discount this cash flow? That's the question. How do we discount it? Well, the, the, the idea here is, is that you're, what's the absolutely the least risky investment? What's the least risky investment that you could possibly make during, it, it, let, let's say, you, say you're looking at the next 19 years, and, and you had, a, and you had, um, uh, the, and, and you had some opportunity to invest. What's the least risky investment? What would be some government bond? In other words, a government bond is typically your is what you call a benchmark. Uh, for that, that you measure investments by, or you measure cash flows. Okay. So, so the thing is, for example, I've talked to you about uh, valuing real estate. Well, where do I, if I've got some building as a future cash flow, where do I get uh, that? For, I don't make up the number, or or if I do, I have to have some logic. So the question here. We're, we're not making, we, we have to have some logic to decide how we discount it. Because we know, we know that the future payment's going to be less than if we got the money now. So, the, the, the most, um, the lowest risk investment is a government bond. And that's going to tell you, if you got the money now, well, you could go and invest it. You can invest it now in a government bond and at, no, at zero risk. That's your least risky investment. So that's why I'm comparing them. This is your bench, is basically 
a, what I would call a benchmark, some benchmark uh, a discount rate. So if you can get 5% interest rate on that bond today, that's telling you that that's a 20 year cash flow at, at 5%. That's saying that your least risky investment, the least risky investment that you made has a, has a, 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 a yield of 5%. Well, that would be your discount rate. So what I'm saying is, is that that's the lowest, that's the lowest risk-free interest rate that you can get in the market. If that is, now obviously now our interest rates are higher, but let's say that that was the case. That was the case, you won the lottery, you won ETO Glenn, and you were getting five million a year for the next 20 years starting, how would you value that? You're gonna discount, well now 5% at, at zero, that's gonna be uh, five billion divided by one plus 0 0.5, uh, 1.05 uh, uh, raised to the zero. So that's just five. It's, so now that means it's five million. A year from now, five million divided by one plus uh, 0 0.05 raised to one. That's how you discount it. Because that is your least risky. That's why I gave you that information. So what I want you to, the, the point here is that that's how you think about value in a future cash flow. When you don't have an interest rate, you have to find one. You have to find one that, that makes sense to compare it with. And the one that makes the most sense to compare it with is the least risky. That's the one that you should measure. Because you could take that investment, if you had that money now, that's you could invest that and get that return. That's your least risky investment. You would, you would be certain of getting that return. So that's how you should discount now. That's how you should discount this cash flow. Because I go, could go out and buy that, that for over the, over the period of this cash flow. I could go out and buy an instrument with that interest rate. Well, that's how I should discount this future cash flow at 5%. That's the answer. And so that's what you need to do. Is, is take this and sum, sum over the five million, the last one, divided by one plus zero point zero five, raised to the nineteen. That's the last one. That's it. That's how. That's the answer. So I want. That's how I want you to think about. That's how I want you to think about how to value cash flow. Then. That that's how you value a future cash flow, and to start thinking about where where you get where interest rates or where discount rates come from, and how you can use a, a, a discount rate. Uh, then we have in question twenty six. Suppose you have a million yen to invest today, and you have the following investment choices. Um, the point here is that the relative risk of any investment now, it's it's going to be. The, um, these returns are telling you the discount rate. The returns always tell you how to discount rate. So, so the, the, riskiest, uh, the riskiest investment is the one with the highest yield. Now we have A is an annual, an expected annual return of 7%. That's, seven, that's A. B is 10%. Well, if I'm expecting an expected annual return of 10% on the investment, and that could be a combination of, of dividends and uh, an and asset price, this is a risk. The future income is discounted higher. It's high, so this is a riskier investment than this. This is this is riskier than the ten percent is more risky than seven. So the ten year JGB with an annual yield of zero point five percent is 
that's very little risk. They're, what they're saying is, well, you're going to almost certain to get this money. And the government will just pay you that. And the market's happy to pay that. So this is, the, this is a very, a, is an extremely low risk. So now the, the last one is your cousin's entry fee next year's World Series of Poker. Now, if you don't know what the World Series of Poker is, it's an annual poker tournament held in Las Vegas, Nevada, in the U.S. Uh, it usually, it typically has about, about maybe seven, 8,000 entrants. And they pay $10,000 each. So 8,000, and you can figure out it's about $80 million. Of, uh, and then they have to run the tournament and all. First, first prize. Well, in, in a poker tournament, the, the, odds of, in, the, the odds of getting your money back, of, of getting any money back, only the top 15% uh, uh, receive any, uh, win anything. 85% win nothing. So that if, if, if the 8,000 people have or entrants have each, have each have the same probability of winning, the probability of getting anything back is only 15%. So that's just get breaking even. The first prize is about $8 million, typically. So if you're going to get 100 million yen, the, the odds of winning of your of your cousin winning is going to be one over roughly one over eight thousand. Now maybe if he's a real good player or she's a real good player, it might be one over five hundred. If they're the best player in the world, it's probably one over a hundred. Even if they're the best player in the world, the odds are maybe one in a hundred. So you're talking about the odds of, of getting that money. <laughs> Your your expected your expected return is really low. Your 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 this is a, this is an incredibly risky. This this is this, this is truly uh, what 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 the British would call a punt. You know the, the term punt in in, uh, in 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 English British English a punt means it's it's just a really something you're just throwing it up in the air and and. And it's just, if, if you get lucky, you're happy. You expect to lose it. You expect, you, you expect to lose this money. <laughs> you, you don't expect to get anything. You have an 85% chance of getting nothing. This is a very, very, very risky. I, I guess you could figure out some kind of percentage. But the, the, but the fact is, it's, it's way, way down. It might be, it might be a, you know, 50%. Maybe even ninety percent discount rate. Right? I mean, you're you're talking. You know, it's a miracle. As they say, you only have a fifteen on, on, at random a fifteen percent probability just of getting your money back. So, this is an extremely risky investment. Extremely risky. So, that's the answer. That's the answer. Is you rate that. Government bond, real estate, uh, corporate stock, poker tournament. You know, so it's a bit of a joke, but you know, people do invest. They, but, but people do invest. No, I mean, there actually are there are people, um, well, well, wealthy people who finance good poker players, and so so they actually do invest. It, it, they, it, they do it for investment. And, uh, they, they sponsor these companies. So so it is. If somebody's good enough, you can get sponsored. But. But and the other the other part of the joke here, there is a bit of a joke because the, the tournament the winning is about uh, eight million dollars or about um, uh, uh, eight hundred million yen. So if he's only going to give you a hundred million yen, you didn't miss, you need to make a better deal. <laughs> you need you need to make a better deal with uh, with your cousin. He's he's not making you a particularly good offer. <laughs> so uh, you have you have to negotiate something better anyway. Even, even if you do make the investment, you need to make you you need to be a harder negotiator. But that's I, I don't even know if that would still make it worth it. But anyway, that's that's that question. Um, let's see. Uh, this was just very straightforward. 
uh, just a, a very straightforward uh, calculation. Um, then I wanted to talk briefly about, yeah. This, um, you're, you're, you're going to do this on, on Thursday, so I thought uh, that this will make, people will be paying attention here, and, and, then, and then you may fall asleep. But, but hang in there for, for this. This this is due on Thursday. But I did just want to briefly go over what I'm what I'm looking for here. Okay. Because if you're trying to want this, this is a little bit diff, you know, it, it's it's some concepts that may seem a little bit difficult. And so I want you so I'll let me go over this to, to tell you what I'm what I'm looking for here. Um, the the idea is we have it we have Basically, this is the form of this utility function. They tried to make the, the utility function as simple as simple as possible, and it's basically it's ba it's based on your use of time. It it basically says that your utility is a function of how you allocate your time between leisure, work, and commuting. And that you're trading off. Each one of those is, a, is there's trade-offs between each one. Each one of those is trade-offs, as we've seen. You can substitute. You can substitute one for the other. Uh, more. Uh, you you can get more work time. That that'll give you more consumption. Uh, if you have a longer commute, you have bigger housing because your the cost per unit of space is lower. But that, that's that's your 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 trade-off. But you have less time for work and less time for leisure. You can have more leisure, but then you have to give up work time and commuting time. So these are various trade-offs. What's the value of the trade-off? The value of the trade-off is the coefficient. The coefficient tells us how you evaluate, how an individual household values leisure time, values work time, and values uh, commuting time. So, and, and yes, there is a value on, on commuting time, because why do people live, why, why, why do people live out in, in, in places like Machida or, or uh, uh, Hachiochi and commute all the way, or, or, or on the Chuo line, why do they live out there? Why do they, does somebody live in Tachikawa and commute all the way in to go for work? Well, because they can get more space. There's a reason. They're giving something up. So they're willing to do that. Well, well the question, what I showed in the last lecture, what I talked about, was the way to value, the way to value that. If you look here, what I showed was that you have different individuals with different ways of valuing time, that valuing uh, commuting time, work time, and leisure time. And the kind of where where they tend the idea is where they tend to locate. So that's what I want to um, you to think about here. This is say uh, how does tell me well how how does commuting time affect the amount of space? So why don't you think about that? Then tell me the trade-offs between leisure time, work time, and commuting time. Well, why don't you think about this equation? And think deeply about it and just look at it. You don't have to do the mathematics, but if you just think about the equation, what it says, and what the meaning of each of the variables, of, of the time variables and of the coefficients are, then you realize that you can put that into somebody's life. That you can take some person and the way that they live, the what's important to them. If they're more, if, if work is the most valuable thing to them, well, that's going to have a high value. If work has a high value to you, then you might not want to spend a lot of time commuting. And so that might have a low value. And if your work is really, really important, well, that's your work is your play, and you don't really care much about leisure time. You'll even willing to give up some sleep. Like, like my, my oldest daughter is, uh, is very ambitious. She lives in Manhattan, in New York City. And she lives in the city. So she goes to, now she's got a job in, 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 in Midtown. She, she walks or rides her bike to work. She's right there. She wants to work all the time. 
And everybody else wants to, who lives there, her boyfriend, he wants to work all the time too. Everybody wants to work all the time. That's all they want to do. They work all the time, and then they'll play a bit, but they don't commute, it's almost zero commute. That's the point. That, that's, so, um, but somebody that lives out in the suburbs, you, you live out, you know, Setagayaku, which is kind of suburbs, some of us anyway. Um, but you live out like, uh, uh, you know, on the Q line way out, or, um, you know, you, you live out this, what is it? Um, what's the, uh, Seijo Gakuen line? Is that the? Yeah, I think that's the, that's the station. You live, that's way out at the edge of, of uh, Setagayaku. You live out there, well, you've got to commute an hour. You live further, you've got to commute more. Well, the, the people, that person is commuting so they can have more space. They probably have a family. They have a house or a big apartment. You know, that, that person cares more about space. That value is higher. And they're giving up leisure, leisure time, certainly, and some work time. But maybe they work a lot still, so they have to give up leisure time. You know, so, so that's the choice that, that they're making. Um, I had a bit of a, it was a bit of a joke, but I talked about the, the city center, somebody who's basically homeless, or, you know, who lives in a very inexpensive, you know, it's very inexpensive housing. Um, uh, as I say, it's, it's hard to find it here, but say a place like in Osaka, a place like Shinsaibashi, uh, places like that, where you can get real cheap housing, there's fairly cheap housing. Um, I mean, you can get it here. You can get cheap, but there's cheap housing that people living near the center live in real small places, really cheap housing. You know, that's um, because they value a lot of leisure. They, 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 they don't want to, maybe they don't want to work and they can't work very much. Uh, and, uh, and they don't care about the size of their unit. So they can afford to live near the city center. So, so that just tells you the different kinds of people. And so what are the benefits the how, what, what are the household giving up and receiving? I want you to think about that. Think about each of these. Think about what this means. That's, that's the idea here. Um, and and, 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 and in, in the end, what I'm trying to get you to realize is those aren't just numbers. That's something, there's a reality behind it. There's, re, there's a reality behind these numbers. These numbers are telling us something about the way the world is and the way the world works. Here, and the, the question 29, I want to consider a Cobb-Douglas production function of, uh, of, of this form. Uh, and, and that is land. That's uh, labor, capital, and, and, and the N is for land. I'm assuming that it's constant returns to scale. So just a constant returns uh, uh, to scale. And I want you to think about what kind of businesses I need to use. What, what is that, like this, this gamma, that's land. It's a firm that doesn't care much about land. But they got a lot of labor, they don't have much land. What kind of firm does that sound like? Where would that firm be? A firm that, that needs a lot of land. It values land very highly, the workers not very highly, and, and it has some capital. What kind of a firm does that sound like? What does that sound like? And, I, and, and, and I'm not looking for some exact answer. I'm looking for something that makes sense. That may, tell me a story, a story of what you, what this seem, these numbers seem to tell you. In other words, take these numbers, think about what they mean, and put it into something that is a reality. Put put that on, on reality. So so, and the the goal of this is to get you to start thinking about as economists to taking the world and putting it into into these kinds of forms, into some math, a mathematical form, so that you can think clearly, clearly about what, what the reality is in, in an ac economic sense, and maybe even be able to collect data, collect data and analyze it. So that's the kind of the, the thing that I'm trying to get you to, uh, to understand, that part of learning the discipline, the discipline of economics, is to be able to do that. So now we're going to. Oh, no, no, no. Was an interesting lecture. There we go. And now, for some of you, it's time to start your nap. Um, the, I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep as interesting as possible. Um, it is an interesting topic, I, I, it's, but it's very difficult. 
that it, it's very difficult. It's very, um, uh, it takes a lot of concentration. And that in itself is not very good at, uh, after having lunch at 2 o'clock in, in the afternoon. So um, I'm going to have some coffee here so I can keep away. And if I need to, I've got the, uh, the students kind enough to give me this monster drink here. So, um, so um, I, I started talking about this. As I said, gender equilibrium, it's the whole economy. Uh, basically, we're talking about uh, some of the things that are related uh, that are related to it. These are some technical terms. Uh, some of that is going to become very clear uh, uh, next next term. So some of this we're beginning to talk about. Uh, we're, we're we're beginning to talk about the subjects that we're going to discuss next term. Now, some of you will be going on to. Uh, some of you won't be here. Uh, the, the, uh, you'll, you'll be going on uh, off abroad on your uh, uh, on, on your uh, study abroad. Uh, but for those of you that will be staying for the next semester, this is what we're going to be moving into. Uh, we're going to take the concepts that we learned this semester and then begin to think about ways that the world that the world really works. We're going to talk about the ways the world really works. Today we're going to wrap up the concept, or today maybe a little bit on, uh, on Thursday, uh, to wrap up the, the concept of something that's kind of a ideal, you could call it an ideal world. It's certainly a world where uh, if, if everything, if all firms, if all firms knew uh, had knew all technologies and they had all inputs and there were many firms and they competed in a perfectly competitive market and if all the, the if all the um, uh, if, 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 if all the, the workers knew uh, uh, knew wages for every firm and they could search for work uh, for, for zero cost work, uh, firms could find workers at zero cost what kind of a world would and, and, and it was all perfectly competitive, what kind of a world would it look like? Now obviously the world is way, way away from that, uh, but what we want to do is establish that as at least an idea, see what the outcome is, and then to compare how the real world is different from that. So that, that's the idea, is, and then because then we can see, well this is how the real world works, these are the assumptions that we have to give up in order to model the real world. We're modeling a world that's not real. And so, but at least it has certain rules, and we can see how the real world differs from that, and then see how the outcome differs from that. So that's kind of basically what we're what we're going to do uh, do next semester. So um, as I say, uh, the, the, in terms of efficiency in, in competition, and when I talk about efficiency, uh, as I mentioned uh, last week, efficiency means that what people want, what people want based on their uh, on their utility functions, is produced by firms at the least possible cost, so that the firms that are making the products, they know what people want. They know the utility functions. They're able to produce the goods. Those firms that produce at the, the, the lowest cost uh, are the ones that have access to the resources to do that. And then the goods are sold to consumers uh, at, uh, at a perfectly competitive price. So that is uh, efficiency. But in that, firms maximize profits. It's not that they're, firms are not shortchanging themselves. Firms have full knowledge of existing technologies and they face the same input prices. And then the second one, final products, products consumed by households, are distributed among households by the price mechanism in such a way that any change from this distribution would reduce well-being for at least some members of the society. In other words, the, uh, the wealth of the society is distributed fairly. 
That's, that's the idea, is that there's some distribution that's fair, that uh, uh, it, it's distributed by the price mechanism. Because remember, the households are all the same. They all have the same skill. They all get up in the morning at the same time, I guess, and do the, now, not that they do the same thing. They may work at different places, but they all are in the same wage. <clears throat> they can work, they, they, can, they can work at the grocery store or, or, or at the bank, uh, at the stock exchange, uh, or, or, or on, 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 on a farm, and they're all, all earning the same money. Um, well, anyway, of course, you, you can see that that's not realistic. But that's, um, that's the assumption that we're, uh, that we're making here. Uh, so, um, uh, but anyway, that the distribution is, uh, is, is, uh, is by the price mechanism. So the constraints come imposed by income and wealth, and within these constraints, households are free to choose the mix of goods that maximize utility. As I say, it's producing uh, the goods uh, that people want. And the condition that the right things are produced is the marginal cost equals the marginal revenue. Very important. That's the, the firm's maximized profits, marginal cost at producing at marginal cost equals to marginal revenue. And that the demand for inputs is, is, uh, is a derived demand. That demand is a function of, uh, uh, of the, uh, the demand for inputs is a function of the output prices. You've had ex those exercises to help you to understand that. See, I think you're beginning to have a, a good sense of that. Um, so now what I'm going to do is uh, I'm, I'm now going to describe a general equilibrium model that uses, uses these principles. And the idea here is, is that we're going to show we're going to show how an economy like that can function, how it functions, how it things, how adjustments are made. So if something changes in the economy, how does it, how are adjustments made? And I think one of the things that you're going to learn here, that you're going to see, is that this is a very simple model. It's incredibly simple. We're only talking about two goods. This is a two good model, two goods X and Y. Uh, uh, we make some assumptions uh, about them. Uh, they're, uh, uh, they're, they're neat, and, and just, just to make it simple, I did, I, we assume that they're neither complements or substitutes, that they're produced by many firms under perfectly competitive conditions. That's both in input and output markets, that they have access to the same technology and input prices. Another important point, is that uh, the firms producing X and Y are operating at constant returns to scale. So there's no advantage or disadvantage depending upon how large the firm is. That just makes it even more complicated. Firms maximize profits. All households are identical. They have identical labor capabilities to the firms. They have the same preference for the goods X and Y. They're all the same. Um, Household income is defined as the household wage rate, which is either PLX or PLY. Um, household demand for, 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 the, for the good X is assumed to be unitary elastic. Very simple, uh, these are very simple, to make the model very simple. The thing is, what we're going to see, this is so simple. This is as simple a model as you can possibly make for a general equilibrium. And it's very complicated. You'll see how complicated this is. And, and one of the things I'd like you to appreciate is how difficult it is. This, because this describes, general equilibrium describes the, the dynamics of an, of an economy. How, 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 er, at all, how households and firms all interact simultaneously interact at the same time uh, to uh, uh, the, the household supply uh, labor, capital, and land. Firms use inputs uh, to supply goods and services and output markets to households in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, a circular, uh, in, in, a, in a circular contained system. So this is a system. 
Uh, and so you will, what we'll see is, is that even if you make some change in even a simple system like that with these very, very simple basic assumptions, how complicated this is. And imagine, when you see how complicated this is, imagine how a real economy, how complicated a real economy is. I think you'll begin to appreciate how complex the economy is. And if anybody tells you that they have an understanding of an economy, just show them this and, and ask them if they, if they can clearly if they can clearly explain something like this to you, then maybe they have some understanding. They probably can't, and they have none. If this is this is how complicated it is. At any rate, um, I just so let's uh, in terms of the equilibrium conditions, we've said from the firm's standpoint, they. Uh, 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 maximize profits by setting marginal cost equals marginal revenue, and the input demand conditions are the marginal revenue profit of labor equals the price of labor, and the marginal revenue product of capital equals the price of capital. So the utility maximizing conditions are that the, mar the, uh, the ratio of the marginal utilities of, of, of good X and price of X is equal to the marginal utilities of, of, of Y to the price of Y. And also the marginal, uh, the household wages are identical in equilibrium. Everybody's getting the same wage. And remember the firm, also for the firm, the profit maximizing condition is that the ratio of the marginal revenue product of labor to the price of labor is equal to the ratio of the marginal revenue product of capital to the price of capital. That's the duality. People, uh, you just had an exercise uh, where you talked about uh, duality. I asked you to talk about that. The duality uh, um, uh, in, 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 uh, implied demand. Uh, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the circular effect, uh, how when firms uh, in, in perfect competition, they set price equals the uh, marginal uh, product, then that determines uh, the, the value of the output, but that determines the price of the input. That determines what you can pay the labor to produce the output. So it's, it's circular, uh, it's, and, and connected, and, 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 and as, you talked about that's that's a duet that's a duality. So we're going to have some household income constraint. The household income constraint says that um, uh, their wage, uh, the, the if if they work in, in a firm that produces X, their wage is is uh, uh, PLX, uh, and that's the same in as PLY. And the amount of, that they consume is simply each household consumes is their income. Income is equal to, uh, they, and they use it all for consumption. There's no savings in this model. Uh, the price of, of, of good X times the, the, the amount of good X plus the price of good Y times the price of Y. Very simple income constraint. What I want to show now that, well, let's say that there are two periods. If there are, are, are two periods, what, uh, uh, and, and I want to now I want to look to introduce the idea that prices can change or wages can change, something can change. So in period one, if, if the wage is this, then, uh, then in period one, the amount of consumption is the price of X, period one times the amount of X consumed in period one, plus the price of Y in period one, times the amount of Y consumed in period one. And the same in period two. Okay, we're just setting up the problem. We're setting up the problem here. Now what we're going to say is, let's consider the case. Now we want to say, well, we've got all that. We know, we, we know that there's some equilibrium price. Let, let, me, let, let, let me make that clear. I'm going to erase this. We have some equilibrium. Uh, uh, some equilibrium price that comes out of that uh, uh, that or, or price is that come out of that uh, condition these these conditions and they are some equilibrium uh, uh, the price of labor there's the, the price of, uh, of labor there's an equilibrium uh, price uh, of, uh, of, of labor for y Let's see where I put that. 
y, x, uh, for y, and, and uh, the equilibrium price y. Um, there's some equilibrium price of x. Uh, there's some equilibrium price of y. So those are, that's going to be produced, it's going to produce some, what they are, we don't care. We're not worried about what they are. They just, it produces it. We just assume it produces it. So, uh, 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 so the market's clear, firms produce, at that price, every, everything is sold, and, and every, everybody maximizes profits and utility. So that's, that's an outcome of, of the model. So now we're going to say, well, what happens if the technology of producing good Y changes, what happens if, if the, um, uh, let's say, uh, we'll assume that the production of good Y becomes more capital intensive. In the process, we'll assume that the increase in capital results in an increase in output per worker from an initial technology state, which I'll call the marginal cost of one for Y. So, the price of Y gives us a marginal cost, plus an equilibrium cost uh, in period one of, uh, of producing Y. Let's see, Y. Yeah, marginal cost of one. Let's say that that's, I guess I should put a Y there under an equilibrium price PY to a new state. And there's going to be some new state, the marginal cost of some Y. That's a new state. So we're going to say, well, what happens if, if, that, uh, if that changes? Let's say, let's say that, um, so there's a new state. If the technology changes, we now have a new marginal cost curve for the representative firms. They all adopt the new technology. They, um, this is a long run, a long run outcome, uh, or it's, we're going to work towards a long run equilibrium outcome. Uh, and what we see is, is that the, for each representative firm, uh, they can produce uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the price of Y uh, declines. They, can pro they produce more output at a lower price. So here's the downward sloping uh, industry demand curve. So the downward sloping industry demand curve, we know why that is, because of diminishing uh, margin of utility uh, in the consumption of Y. But the, so the price falls, they could consume more of, uh, of Y. And this is the increase. There's some increase uh, that, that happens. But the important thing here to consider and to remember is that this is a partial equilibrium analysis. This is the kind of analysis that we've been doing so far, and it's a partial, partial equilibrium. So what do we have to do here? We have to consider what happens, um, what happens to the rest of the economy. Because this is not in a vacuum. It doesn't, we're not operating in a vacuum here. The price, the, the firms are producing more, uh, more Y. They're producing it at a lower price. Well, that means household, that's going to affect everything. Every household changes. Everything is going to change. So what we have to do is look at how the, the, the wages of, 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 uh, of, good, of good Y change, the wages of good workers in good exchange. The, the size of, of each industry, do workers need to move from one industry to the other? If so, how many workers move, change industries? What's the, the, ultimate, uh, the ultimate impact on, on, on the utility, on utility levels? All of these questions, we can't answer yet. We have to consider them. We have to consider the impact. That's what, this is just a partial equilibrium. We have to consider the whole picture. So, we've noted the decline in price here. See the decline in price of, produce, of, of PY, the increase in output. But the change in both price and output affect the output per worker. 
So for the same amount of uh, uh, what we, uh, so what we have to consider, um, we have to, 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 to consider is how does this change the wage rate of, for workers for good Y? Oh, okay, now I remember, I, I talked about that X is unitary elastic, the production of X, in other words, uh, the, the elasticity is one, so the elasticity of X uh, equals to one at all levels of output. So it just means it's some, it, it's some kind of production function that no matter the, uh, the elasticity of demand is always one. That's, there's some kind of, it's a curve that looks like that. So that's, okay, so now I'm gonna look at what happens if, at, and I'm gonna allow different elasticities of demand for Y, and then you're going to see, oh boy, <laughs> it seems pretty simple, but it's uh, going to have a big impact. So, now, so the wage rate for workers for good Y, remember in equilibrium, the wage rate is equal to the marginal revenue product of labor of Y. That's the wage rate. The firms are going to pay the marginal revenue product of labor. So we have to figure out what's the production of, of Y, uh, how, how many workers, and, and what's for that last worker that the firm hires, what's the, uh, the marginal revenue product of labor for the last worker? Well, that's the wage, that is the equilibrium wage rate. So we want to see, does that change? Okay. So if the demand for Y is elastic, if the demand is, is elastic, that is that, um, so that each household each household at the price, uh, uh, that that means that uh, if, if it's elastic, that the decline in, um, uh, uh, let's see, let's make sure I'm doing this right. Right. Right, the price, the price drops. Right, it's the price drop, if the demand is elastic, the price drops and the increase is so much the, the demand changes so much that the, the amount that the, the household pays for Y is greater. So that's what's happening here, is that if it's elastic, that, that, that by definition that means that after the change that each household consumes more, that the amount that they pay for Y increases. So that the quantity of Y in period two times the price of Y in period two is greater than the quantity of Y consumed in period one times the price of Y in period one. That's the definition of, elast of, of an elastic demand. Then, we're, we've got the same number of, uh, then the revenue uh, per, uh, per worker increases. So the revenue has gone up. So we haven't, we haven't said anything about the change in the number of workers. They're just more efficient. We haven't changed the number of workers yet. We've just changed the output. The output has increased, and industry revenue has increased. So think about that. We, we don't have any change in the number. We haven't talked about a change in the number of workers. But we've had uh, the, uh, we know that the output per firm has increased. The price has dropped, but households are paying more. So they're buying, so the marginal revenue is greater. The marginal revenue has increased, which means that the wage rate in industry two has increased. Compare, in industry in Y in period two has increased compared to period one. That's what happens if demand for Y is elastic. Now, let's look if, if demand for Y is inelastic. If it's, uh, if it's inelastic, the price has dropped, Demand doesn't change. The percentage change in demand is less than the percentage change in the price. That's the definition of an inelastic demand. Then the amount that consumers spend on Y after the price change is less. They spend less money. They, so that means the quantity of Y in period two times the price of Y, which is lower in period two, is less than the original 
consumption of y times the original price of y in period one. And then in that case, since we have the same number of workers, we haven't changed the number of workers yet, then the revenue per y, per y worker decreases and the marginal revenue product of labor is less. There's less revenue. So that marginal worker has to be paid less. That means that the wage rate in, for, uh, for Y in period two is less than the wage rate for workers in Y in period one. So now we see if it's inelastic, so whether the wage rate changes is, depends upon the elasticity of demand or the product. So now if demand for Y is also unitary elastic, and now we can see the reason why we make X unitary elastic, because otherwise if, if, X, uh, if, if X is a function of Y, then there's the cross, we have to worry about cross price elasticities. Then it gets really complicated. So let's just keep this simple. Uh, it's hard enough. So, if demand for Y is unitary elastic, that is, if the quantity, the amount spent is exactly the same, then the revenue per worker stays the same, and the marginal revenue product of labor is the same, which means the wage rate stays the same. So then in that case, the only thing happens is that the wage stays the same. There, there's, there's no adjustment of wage. This is the simplest case. If the demand is unitary elastic and the demand for X is unitary elastic, the price of, 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 of producing Y falls, people spend the same amount, which means that the marginal revenue product is the same, and then the wage is the same. It's just that people can, are, but people are, everyone's better off because now they're consuming more Y. Everyone's better off. They all, but the wages don't set, change. Wages don't change, everyone's better off because the price is declined, but the way, in other words, they can buy more Y. They can buy more Y. Very simple. Okay. So that's what happens in that case. <clears throat> it's actually kind of fun if you can just kind of keep it all straight. You have to really focus and concentrate, which is really hard. In 215, let's see. People are doing okay. This lecture must be more exciting than I, than I thought. Um, so, um, okay, now we're gonna, so let's think about, uh, about yeah, each of these. <clears throat> because the thing is, is that if the wage changes, how, how, how do we have to think about that? If the wage of Y changes, then the system is not in equilibrium because if the wage of Y changes, and, and, and remember X has, there's no change in X. Something has to change for X. It has to change. So that's what we need to consider. What happens? What happens to the whole system? And as you say, you'll see right away how dizzyingly complex this gets, uh, even with this incredibly simple model. So if demand for Y is unitary elastic, if, Q, uh, if the quantity of Y consumed in period two times the price of Y in period two after the uh, technological change is the same as in period one, the revenue Y per worker stays the same, as we said, then the marginal revenue products are the same, and if that's true, the wage is the same, then <clears throat> the wage is the same, then equilibrium, then there's no change in the, in the wage of, in, in industry X. So the, the wage rate for X workers remains the same. And remember that the, uh, uh, that the ratio, uh, the ratio of the marginal utilities must also uh, uh, stay the same. So that also means that since the, uh, that the, margin, that, that the marginal utilities uh, 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 shift, but the, um, and uh, uh, they, they have to hold. Okay. Um, now we're going to consider the second possibility where the demand for Y is elastic. So if demand for Y is elastic, 
then that means that since the price drops, we're consuming, we're spending more money on Y than we did before. Households are spending more on Y in period two than, than period one. Then the revenue per Y worker increases. The marginal revenue product of labor increases in period two, which means that the wage rate for, uh, if for workers in industry Y in period two is greater than in period one. So then we need to consider the potential effect. Now, so what happens is, what happens is the price of labor in industry Y in period two is greater than the price of labor in, in period Y. We have to consider what the effect on the wage rate for the, 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 the price of labor in industry X. But since PL, since the price of labor industry Y in period one is the same, because that's what produced this equilibrium, initial equilibrium outcome, then the price of, of labor in industry Y now in, in period two is greater than the price of labor in industry X in period one. It's greater. Then that means the system is not an equilibrium. So something else has to change. It's not an equilibrium. The wages are too high. So what, what's going to So that means if the wages are higher in, 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 in industry Y, well then they're gonna, they're gonna have higher utility. But then the workers in industry X are gonna say, well, well wait a minute, we, we'll just go and work for, the, there's workers in X are gonna shift to Y. They're going to shift to Y because the wages are higher. Because there's no cost in, shift, in shifting. So remember here, there's no cost in shifting. It's, it's, it's cost, the, the cost of shifting is, uh, is, uh, is zero. So remember, so how do we achieve equilibrium in the system? Remember that the marginal revenue product of labor curve represents the firm's demand curve for the input factor labor. So that the marginal revenue product of labor curve is downward sloping as the quantity of labor used by the firm is increases. So it's a downward sloping. Firms have a downward slope, it looks like this, but in relevant part, it's a downward sloping demand curve uh, for, uh, for labor. Which means that the demand for labor increases. The marginal revenue product uh, uh, of, of labor uh, increases. Um, so since uh, the price of labor is in equilibrium, and since the price of labor in Y in 2 is greater than the price, uh, the, the price of labor for X in 1, then the price of labor must fall and the price in, in Y and the price of labor in X must rise. So both of them happen simultaneously. And, and, and how does that happen? Uh, labor must move from firms producing X to firms producing Y. The firm, labor in X is going to look at, uh, at, the, at, at Y and say, well, you're paying, the, 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 the marginal revenue product is higher. That means your wage is higher. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to shift to that firm. And, and for, for industry, um, industry Y, they're saying, okay, great. Their, uh, our wages are higher, but we can hire more labor, which means that our marginal revenue product of labor falls. So that means then the wages begin to drop in Y. Labor is moving out of X, this downward sloping, the marginal revenue product of labor for X is the demand, uh, the demand curve for labor. So since there's fewer workers in X, that means that the wage, and there's fewer workers, they're moving up the marginal revenue product of labor curve in X. You're moving up in this direction, here, and moving up. Then wages are increasing in X. So that's the story. The story is, the workers move from one to the other, they move from X to Y, until enough workers move so that the, the marginal revenue product of labor in the two industries is equal. 
So we can see the cyst, that is how the system is, is going to, to equilibrate. So, and again, I'm assuming, in order to simplify this analysis, I'm assuming the demand for X is unitary elastic. So the demand for X is unitary elastic makes things a lot simpler. So you can see that mechanism. You can see the mechanism that's happening. That's the adjustment. That's how, how, how this economy is adjusting to the change if the, and, but the important point is, why is this happening? Because the demand for uh, 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 the, the, the demand for Y here is elastic. That's why this is happening. It has to the, the, the whole outcome is happening because of the overall because of the, the elasticity of demand. And here for, for Y, and here the elasticity of demand uh, is, is elastic. Now I'll show, right, I'm, gonna sh I'm showing this process. So here, if labor shifts from X to Y, then the output of Y must increase. This is the initial point. It's increasing here. It must increase beyond the point Y to the point uh, Y2 prime. So the increase in the output of Y results in a lower price of Y. And then the output of X must decrease. So the output of X is decreasing. And the price of X must increase. So there's less X is produced. Production of X is falling. The price of X is rising. There's more production of Y. The price continues to fall. Producing a new, uh, so so the the the, the price is, uh, is is falling. Um, so in increasing the output level y from q y to in order to achieve the equilibrium and the resulting decrease in the price of y. The figure okay the simultaneous decrease in the output level. Uh, that's the, in, the decrease the output level of that. So that's happening simultaneously. So workers are moving uh, from uh, from X to Y. So X to uh, uh, they're moving from X to Y. They're producing less X. The price of X rises. The price of Y uh, uh, continues to fall. And then the simultaneous changes on, of labor and the wage rate in each section sector. So we can see that the uh, in Y, there's the marginal revenue product of the labor curve. We're moving down and to the right, downward sloping. The wage lowers, the wage rises in X as the output is reduced. And it goes until the, 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 until the wages equilibrate, until the wages become the same. So you can see this is why we do, in order to keep the problem simple, why we make these assumptions. Now, if you're going to analyze this uh, by looking at, at different productivities, different wage rates, you'll see it's a much more complicated problem. And you can certainly do that. You can do that. But this is the base. This just allows us from the base to look and see that if we make these very simple assumptions, what happens? This is what happens if you have an increase in productivity uh, in, in one sector. and the demand for that uh, that product is uh, elastic. Now we can consi consider the case for why the demand for Y is inelastic. Now, as we noted earlier, if, if demand for Y is inelastic, that is, if the quantity of Y in period two times the price of Y in period two is less, because the price goes down, the demand doesn't change. The change in demand is less than the percentage change. The percentage increase in in the in the quantity of Y consumed is less than the decrease in the price. 
So the total amount spent by each household falls. So the quantity of Y in period two times the price of Y in two is less than the quantity of Y consumed in period one times the price of Y. That's what happens with inelasticity. So the revenue per, and remember we still have, before the change, the revenue, uh, we still have the same number of workers. So the same number of workers, people are spending less, that means the marginal revenue product of labor, the last worker, is lower. It has to be lower because the revenue is lower. So the marginal revenue product of labor of the last worker, because the number of workers has changed, is lower, which means that the wage rate of Y in industry, um, in, in, of, of labor in industry Y in period two is less than in period one. So we need to consider the potential effect of a lower price of labor here PY of labor in period, period two, that's less, on the wage rate for the price of uh, uh, the wage rate for X. Uh, since the price of labor in one equals for Y in equilibrium is the price of labor in, in X, then in period two, the price of labor is now less in Y than in X, if the demand for Y is inelastic. So now we can see that the system, again, it's not in equilibrium. Because now workers in Y are, are, are paid less, and now they're going to look at Industry X and say, well, this isn't a good deal. I want to move to Industry X. Workers are going to start moving to Industry X, and may, maybe they all get together and decide who moves. Well, they flip a coin, and, and workers start moving. I don't know how they do it, but uh, you know. These other, there's some way that they just start flowing uh, uh, magically, and they start flowing to the other industry. Um, so, uh, since the price of labor of, of, of in equilibrium, then the price of labor, it's too low. It has to rise, and the price of labor in industry X must fall until the two are equal. So as I said, labor must move this time from firms producing Y to firms producing X. And in doing so, the price of labor in Y will rise, the price of labor in X will fall, until the two are equal. Okay. So now we're going to look at that process graphically. So if labor shifts from Y to X, then the output of Y must decrease from the point QY2 to QY2 prime. So the output is increased, but it turns out in equilibrium it's too much. Because the, um, the, pr the price fell, but now it has to shift back, and now the price it is going to uh, is, is, is going to rise. So the price of, of Y rises. There's downward sloping demand. Um, so let's see where are we? The, 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 I'm uh, PY2 right. The output of X must increase. So here's the output of X. The output of X must increase. Here's the initial in period one. It goes to x2 prime, it falls, and what's happening is it's going to fall until the price of, of x in period 2 uh, is such that, the, that it, it'll fall, uh, the output will increase and it'll fall until, until the marginal revenue product of labor in the two industries is the same, which will then mean the wages are the same. So the next page we're going to look at simultaneous changes. Simultaneous shift in the output of X. What we see here now is the output of X increases. So that means the, the price of, since the, uh, the demand for labor, uh, the marginal revenue product of labor curve is the, uh, uh, is, is the, uh, the firm's demand for labor. 
So the demand for labor increases, the marginal revenue product of labor is falling because the price of X is falling. So, but, but it's still higher than in Y, so workers keep on flowing from, uh, from Y to X, and that occurs until, at the same simultaneously, in, in industry Y, or reduction, and again, downward sloping uh, demand curve based on the marginal revenue product of labor in Y, so the wage is increasing, decreasing in X, increasing in Y, until, until the marginal revenue products of labor in X and Y are equal, and the wage is equal. So that's the new equilibrium point. So the wages are now equal again. Everybody's, is, so that means the wages are equal. It also means the utilities are equal, because then, then they're buying the same amount. They have the same utility function. They're buying the same amount. They have the same demand, the same wage. Everything's equal. That's the new equilibrium. So that's what we're saying. We're saying how we get to the new, um, and that's kind of it. Oh no! I planned to let you go home early today. <laughs> I know it's a holiday and all, and when you came, he wanted an hour and a half, and you're not getting it. Um, well, the, I, I will, I'll just think, this, I got this, this was at, this also shows, this was exercise, last year, the students, that was the last exercise, it was exercise question 63. So just to let you know, you've gotten half the exercise questions. What a nice guy I am. Well, now, uh, now, actually, there was more questions that were easier, so um, I don't think it was any uh, more difficult. Um, I mean, probably had to spend as much time. But at any rate, what I what I have this is something um, I didn't I, I'm not I didn't have that uh, I'm not going to ask that here, but you might see something like this on the final exam. I, I don't know. <laughs> might you might. But, um, and we'll, we'll talk about, so this is just, this is the kind of thing where this, in this particular question, this is, I, I will want you, I will say this, whether I ask exactly this, or whether I ask something a little bit different, I will want you to explain to me, and I will ask a question on the final exam that we'll have to do uh, with this lecture, so you can at least explain the process of general equilibrium that I've so eloquently described to you uh, today, and you'll be able you'll be able to watch the lecture uh, again in order to make sure that you get it straight. And I have checked; um, I've seen that people have, in recent weeks have been flocking have been flocking to watch the uh, uh, the, the, the the lecture. Um, so if you have, well, actually, you're not. Actually, no one's been watching. The, <laughs> I checked, and I, I don't think anybody's. It, 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 if you watch the lecture, you might be the only person. Um, but I, you know, uh, but I think that at least you'll be. This will give you the opportunity to go back and, and, and at least watch this lecture. Um, you do have all of the lectures on, online, and it's possible, it's possible that it may be useful for you to go back and watch the lectures as part of the final. And I will, on the last uh, uh, class this Thursday, um, uh, I will talk a bit, I'll spend time talking about the final exam to make it worth your while to come in the afternoon for the, for the last class. So, but with that, I must sadly close the class 10, 11 minutes early, and you'll have to find something to do. You'll have 11 minutes of that you won't know what you'll be that, that you thought you were going to be sitting here, and you'll have to find something else to do. So, with that, um, enjoy enjoy your holiday. <laughs> Well, 